we do five minute talks and they're strictly limited to five minutes. So at five minutes we will walk you off the stage. We'll sort of slowly creep up from the side to give you a bit of warning before the buzzer goes off. Um, and the talks are supposed, they're at most five minutes. They can be less if you want. Um, we will call you up uh, and we'll tell you who is going to give the next talk um, so that you can come up to the front. Um, so Sebastian, you're on deck. Yeah, so that, so that you're on deck. And uh, the last thing is that if you're not here when your name is called, um, and if you signed up to give a lightning talk, you will be crossed off the list and skipped. So uh, we're keeping to a pretty rigid schedule here. And we're very serious, you can tell. Very, very, very serious. Um, and so for our first talk, actually, is Aaron Muir. Muir, is that? You don't know how to say <laughs> Aaron is Anthony's uh, Niemeyer. Uh, Niemeyer. This is my boss. Um, <laughs> this is my. <laughs> Don't throw stones. Um, I suppose he needs a mic. Yeah, he also needs a mic, so we'll give him a mic um, and maybe try to get another one during the talk. And then uh, Sebastian is up next. So if you're on deck, where are you? Or if you could come up to the front. Where's oh, there you are. Great. Where's Perfect. My, where's my timer? Oh, I've got your timer. Can, I see it? can you put it where I can see it? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony Scopitz. <laughs> oh, burn. Wow. Um, all right, uh, who here uses GitHub pages? OK, everyone. So you all know, already know what it is. Um, basically, uh, yeah, you, you just put some HTML in a special branch on your uh, GitHub repo, and GitHub magically turns that into a website. Uh, and it's all done for you. Um, okay, who here uses this website? This is Travis CI. Yeah, so Travis, uh, you basically, uh, for free, uh, you can set up, they'll uh, run your tests for you every time you push a commit to your GitHub repo. Um, and so the goal here is what if we could do this with this? Um, and so who here has ever tried to push up to GitHub pages from Travis? Cool, so if you've ever tried to do that, you might find pages like this. Um, you, might, you might have actually found this page or maybe this page. Um, and it's kind of complicated. You have to like go in and, and create like an SSH key and you have, to, you have to encrypt some stuff and you have to kind of make sure that these secret encrypted things don't get leaked in your Travis logs or else people will have full access to your GitHub account. That's kind of bad. And you gotta figure out how to do syncing to your GitHub pages. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, if, if the code that you're sort of using in production is sort of copy-pasted from some GIST you found on the internet, that's kind of bad. Um, so, you know, last year at SciPy, I was talking with Gil Forsyth about this, and we said, yeah, maybe we should just uh, write something that does all this for you. And so that's how Doctor was born. Um, and so you just install it um, with Pip or Conda, and you just run... Uh, it's basically two steps. You run Docker configure, um, and that'll ask you some questions. I'll show you, and then you just put one line here. Uh, let me make this bigger. You just put this one line in your Travis file, and it syncs everything for you. Um, and so now we're going to try something. So here's what Docker configure looks like. They want your username. Uh, it might be a bad idea to do this live. <laughs> also, since Anthony's phone is dead. It's too late. Oh, I've got two minutes. Oh, well, there's my GitHub password. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like it was recorded, it's fine. So I'll be changing that soon. <laughs> Uh, and then, yeah, and it supports two-factor authentication. So here's my, for those of you who are logging in onto my GitHub account right now, this is the, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then so then you, you type in, uh, you type in the, like for example, uh, I've got this repo that we had our tutorial um, on, and uh, I spelled it wrong. Ah, oh, damn it. Well, anyway, we're gonna skip that. <laughs> Here's an example. 
uh, uh, this library that Gil maintains. Uh, it's kind of hard to build the docs for. You need like a GPU or something. Um, but it works on Travis. Uh, and so here you can see the Travis build log for it. Uh, the most recent one, it's uh, you know adding a bunch of these files to uh, GitHub to Git, and then it's doing a uh, push, and here it is. Um, and I just want to mention, this isn't just for documentation. Anything that's HTML can be deployed from Travis CI to GitHub pages. So here's my blog. Um, I'm using, uh, you can see my, my blog is built on Travis, it's, and it um, is pushed to GitHub pages. Um, here's a, uh, a website for a, a conference that's uh, also been being built on Travis. This one's actually pushed to a, a, a separate repository that supports these, uh, these uh, separate GitHub pages repositories. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll be at the sprints if you want to talk to me about this, or I'll be here all day, all uh, conference, or you can talk to Gil Forsyth. Uh, he also, and uh, it's it's on GitHub. Uh, it's GitHub uh, doctor doctor slash doctor is the repo name because doctor slash doctor was already taken, and doctor stands for docs on Travis. <laughs> Uh, so this one's actually pretty quick. So I've been keeping a list of all of the links to the tutorials um, on that link. So if you want to see what it looks like, uh, something simple. It's got a very simple table of contents. And I've been trying to search for all of the tutorial stuff through GitHub. So all I did was search for SciPy 2017. Um, I've also been trying to get a link of all the talks that were going on, at least the ones I've been attending. So if anyone wants to help contribute, please contribute. Um, but yeah, so for those of you who weren't able to attend the tutorials the past two days, I've been trying my best to find all of the materials for you guys. So that is my talk. Wow, over in a flash. I have a project I want to talk to people about. If you go to tinyurl.com, mod sim pi for modeling and simulation in Python. It's a project I'm working on, class I'm teaching in the fall, and a book that I'm working on. And I'm looking for people to tell me about project ideas I can use for the book. I'm looking for relatively simple physical models that the students can use that really show modeling in a useful way, where we are using it to predict something we care about, or explain why a system behaves the way it does, or to design something, to do some kind of optimization. And I'm currently, I have three chunks of this. First part is discrete systems, so things like population growth, or epidemiological models, like SIR models. Uh, second chunk is first order systems, so things like chemical kinetics. And then the third chunk is second order systems, so mechanics, and maybe circuit analysis. So those kinds of project ideas. The URL is tinyurl.com, mod sim pi for modeling and simulation in Python. Send me email. Thank you. Really throw the book at him. <laughs> Too easy. All right. Um, <laughs> After, after Oliver, we have Floris. There we go. Let's see. Surface says. Oh. Yes. yes. Hey, Woohoo. Quite nice. OK, good. So uh, that's my first point for today. It worked. OK. <laughs> At least. Um, so yesterday, I was talking about some people, um, why convolutional neural networks actually work. And we have no idea, so to be honest. But uh, I actually talked uh, to some French people, and they allowed me to use their graphics. You will see in a, in a second. So first of all, this would be like a very famous neural network. Anyone knows which one it is? Which one is it? Inception model, exactly right. So um, it's by Google, and it consists of many layers. So each of these uh, blue uh, or green box is a layer, and each layer consists of many feature channels. And each feature channel spits out something that you may call a feature. Um, but um, what goes on inside something like this? So it classifies images. You put in something like a cat, and then how does it know? 
how does it actually make the prediction? And that's pretty tricky. And the, there are some techniques to visualize this, like to get, give us an idea for various reasons. And the first one um, is a heat map on an image, for example. And this heat map uh, tells us where is the elephant nest? Like, where is the elephant in, in this picture? Uh, when the model makes the prediction, this picture contains an elephant. And uh, the brighter it is, like the, the uh, red spot here in the middle, it tells us there's a lot of elephantness here. <laughs> so I took this from Francois Cholet, and I practiced the name. Um, and he wrote a really good book about uh, deep learning with Python. And Francois is the creator of uh, Keras. Not quite sure if I pronounce Keras correctly. So a second picture is stolen from Francois. Uh, this is a cat, and the idea is if you put in a cat like this, that you try to find out which feature channels actually activated. And then using a technique, you can draw that feature, feature channel in a, in a specific way. So that cat triggers one feature channel in the top. Uh, it's hard to see, I know. I'm sorry for that. And it's, it's like the uh, edge detection thing in the upper right. In, in the lower right, you see two eyes, like two spots. And those two uh, feature channels will be triggered. It turns out um, the deeper the neural net goes, the less feature channels are triggered, because um, in earlier uh, stages, edge detection always works and it always makes sense. And in, in uh, later stages, um, they only make sense if it's actually a cat that you see. So this is the second technique. And you may, may use a more sophisticated uh, display of that. And you can find it in the book from, uh, uh, of Francois as well. OK, third one. This is the deep dream approach. And the idea is to generate images by uh, using um, gradient ascent um, to activate certain feature channels to a maximum. And doing this, you try to get an impression of what the network sees. There's a link to the uh, notebook, so you can try it out later. But this is, for example, um, something that the network sort of sees in a very early stage. So this is like patterns. It's just some patterns, some stuff. And from that pattern, in the next layer, you might see something like this. So this is actually from the real uh, inception model. You see something like flowers, maybe. And if you go down, like to final layers, you may actually find scary stuff, like this stuff. I have no idea what it is. I picked it randomly. I generated it. It might be spiders going through houses. I don't know. Oh, sorry. And inspired by that, because it's scary, some people actually use it to add hallucinations or dreams to real pictures. Like, I don't see, I don't know if you see it well, but this is like the picture of a squirrel, and they added a certain overactivated uh, feature channel to that squirrel, and that feature channel contains snouts of like dangerous dogs or something. I don't know. And it, it reminds me a little bit of hallucination. And uh, it turns out that Austin squirrels are also very sensitive to these hallucinations. I just prepared this half an hour ago. So this is, I don't know if it's, it's really visible, but it's full of snouts. Even, even out of the year of the squirrel, you see a snout. This one, you like it? And finally, this one. OK, and I'm out of time. And finally, that one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Oops. Another Mac, new luck, hopefully. It's, uh, if this one works, I will downgrade my Mac, I think. <laughs> Yeah, that looks Woo! better. Woo! It's still loading though, but okay, interesting. But it's progress. <laughs> so yeah, I've honestly 
to be completely honest, I just put together some slides. I needed more time, so, you know, it's... Um, <laughs> Woo! But yeah, as you can see, I'm well prepared now. I prepared uh, one slide or maybe a, some more slides. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is really not machine learning, but maybe something that can be fed into a machine learning model. So uh, recently, or maybe just last week, I submitted a new manuscript for a new toolkit that I developed in collaboration with uh, some experimental biologists. And that is all about like virtual screening, like drug discovery, ligand-based uh, virtual screening. And uh, I haven't finished up the documentation yet completely, but it will go live in the next couple of weeks. There's just a placeholder here right now. Um, so what this tool does, it's a, a, yeah, a toolkit for doing virtual screening, like building pipelines. And it's a little bit small here, but it has like, uh, it lets you construct hypothesis-driven uh, pipelines, which is, uh, what was our goal? We didn't want to build a brute force uh, thing. We wanted to test as scientists different hypotheses. And it lets you filter based on general uh, properties of molecules, like the weight and if it's purchasable or not. And then it, um, this has to be from a database, for example. But usually, database come with that information. And then you can filter based on what types of atoms are there. Let's say I'm interested in uh, in molecules that have certain uh, interactions with the protein, I can say, okay, my molecule has to have at least an oxygen group at some point, a keto group. Then I can look for distances. Do my molecules have certain groups in a certain distance? Because, for example, I have a hypothesis that a molecule needs to interact with uh, two residues on the protein. Things like that. And we use other tools. Uh, we embed other tools from, let's say, OpenEye, but it could be anything to generate uh, flexible molecules. Uh, overlay them, and then here, uh, that's again in the toolkit that we developed. Uh, we do a pattern matching, basically, uh, which function groups are present. We can set uh, scoring thresholds and things like that. And then we can select molecules of interest, and uh, yeah, then basically that's what I did, my part of the work, and then I passed it on to my colleagues, the experimental biologists who tested them in the lab to see if that works or not. And that, yeah, based on the results, I got for supervised learning, some feedback that I could back, uh, feed back in into the system, get new results and stuff like that. And um, that's, for example, it's very small, but it's how a typical pipeline could look like. Uh, I think it's too small to really make sense out of it. Um, but the question here was, or oh, we had the hypothesis um, that we need a keto group and a sulfate group at a certain position because we knew from a homology model of the protein how it might bind to the protein. And we did like these kind of filtering steps here. And what I want to highlight here is maybe we have a database of 13 million molecules, like 3D structures. And on a normal desktop computer, the whole pipeline here, finding, let's say, 300 molecules of interest for the experiment takes about one day uh, on a desktop computer, which is kind of cool, I think. It's also, of course, multi-processing. You can run this on HPCC clusters and stuff like that. And yeah, hopefully I will have the documentation uh, up soon. It's still under construction here. Uh, link is here, uh, GitHub PSA lab screen lamp. Uh, we'll also have a fork on my GitHub uh, handle. And yeah, uh, maybe more interesting, I mean, if you want to build your own pipelines or stuff like that, I've, uh, that is basically the engine behind it, uh, called it BioPandas, because it's based on Pandas, the data frame library. And here my goal was basically having a common, uh, or using some open source toolkit that, has, that everyone uses, everyone is familiar with, because then once you have your data in a common format, like a data frame, you can plug it into anything, like any uh, scikit-learn, machine learning package, and stuff like that. And yeah, I have a JOS link here, so it's, it was submitted to JOS at some point, so. <laughs> um, yeah, and what you can do with that, for example, is you have a molecule, a MOL2 file, for example, like that. You can read it in, and then it shows you the MOL2 file as a data frame. Actually, very simple, but since Pandas is so cool and powerful, you can do all kinds of filtering steps based on that. You can uh, look for, a certain, for the presence of certain atom types, filter by charge or distance between atoms and things like that. And here, for example, how, how it might look like if you are interested only in molecules that have a keto group and a, a fluor atom in a certain distance, let's say 10 angstrom. Uh, I have some code here, which is probably too small to read. But in a few steps, you can narrow it down, find in a large database molecules of interest that have these properties. And uh, more examples on GitHub in the documentation of BioPandas. 
Uh, I use it to read in like files of millions of molecules. There's a an multiprocessing example. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I thought that was an illuminating talk. <laughs> Bad. Uh, all right, so right now we have uh, Flores, and then after Flores, we have Pamela. Pamela, are you there? All right, there we are. Thanks. You can tell another joke. It's I'm Thad. This no, is okay. Flores. Um, so th that's going to get the computer going. Um, so we actually have a poster over there right by the door. Um, we made a package called Figure First that makes it easy and fun to make beautiful scientific figures using Matplotlib and Inkscape. Yeah, so I'll just give you a little demo here. Um, and the idea is you start out with a layout document, which is basically an SVG document. And then from that, you can lay out the uh, plotting spaces that you want to send your data to. And so I've got um, a layout document prepared here. And if I can bring it up. Um, uh, since apparently, in order to get uh, t your figures to be remembered, it's important to include beer as part of the document. So I've started with this SVG document that has a little diagram with the beer of the bottle. And what I'm going to do is just draw a box right here. And we've added a couple Inkscape tools to make this a little easier, but we're going to tag it with a tag, which ends up getting translated into a name in Python. And I'm going to call it Bubbles. All right. And then we can go to a Jupyter Notebook and import our library here, uh, which we call Figure First. Um, and then if that, we can probably make this a little bit bigger so everyone can see it. Um, yeah, so we just um, create a layout object using the name of the SVG uh, layout document. And then in the second line here, we get access to the axis that we've created uh, via the name that we tagged it with. And we just plot some data to it. And this is the outcome right here. And of course, that's not really terribly pretty. So um, we can also get rid of some of the uh, distracting plotting um, features and make um, a very, very uh, important uh, bit of data analysis. How are we doing in, how are we doing in terms yeah. of time? Yeah. OK. Where are we at? Three minutes. Three minutes? All right. Um, just one, one um, second feature. Like if we, the nice thing about this is once we create our axis and we plot it to it, it's, it makes it pretty easy to um, adjust the uh, the plotting layout, so I could change the um, dimensions of this axis, and we want to make this black this little box go away. I can hide it, um, and then I can even add other um, axes, uh, which is now invisible here. I don't want to bore you guys with um, a really serious data analysis problem, so I'll let Flores describe a, maybe a little more trivial example. Um, OK, so that was kind of a toy problem. I'm going to show you a figure from the wild. That is a, a paper that I'm working on that's in press. Um, where is it? I think we just hit Inkscape. Um, oh, here we go. There it is. OK. so. Um, here is a figure that I'm working on. The actual data doesn't really matter to you. What should matter is that it's pretty complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on there. There's many different panels. And to actually construct something like that using uh, subplots and stuff would be a huge pain in the ass. Um, OK. Um, so I have my design uh, file uh, layer hidden. But here are all the axes that I've drawn. And I've actually created a template feature here um, that's then repeated for these larger guys there. So you only have to draw those axes once, and then you can use them um, in a nested dictionary on the Python end of things. Um, and then we've implemented a couple other things, like if you click on one of these figures, and if you find uh, in the handy XML editor in here, um, we can actually save certain features. Like if I go and find that particular layer, Um, we can save the date 
that that uh, was modified, that that particular layer was modified, um, and the traceback, so you actually know what function where on your computer you actually called, because I don't know about you, but I often lose you know, what functions get called where. So that helps keep everything organized. And we're looking to expand this so that it's actually um, even more extensible so that someone could then take this file and essentially run that code off of an online um, repository to regenerate your data. Thank you. And come see our poster if you're interested. Thank you very much. That talk was short and stout. Oh. <laughs> Uh, all right, that's that's it. That joke, we're we're done. Um, <laughs> uh, so up next is Pamela, and then after Pamela, we have Nick Murphy. Nick. So this is just on a different screen, so I guess I have to like. Uh oh. Sorry, I have to like eat up in some of my time just like with the settings, because I didn't realize that the display was going to do this. The time is yours. You can use it to do whatever. You can tell really bad jokes, as it turns out. We, we could. I mean. You got any? No, you're, you're done. Oh, oh, no, I've got plenty. <laughs> so say, Hang Anthony. I'm just, I'm just uh, wait, I'm just going to, OK. Go for it. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> um, keep this configuration. Yes. OK, I'll just do it like this. OK, so um, uh, I'm making SynthPy. Um, I'm from, I'm in bioinformatics and in bioinformatics data is somewhat messy because life is messy and there's often no way to prove that your algorithm is necessarily the correct one, only the one that minimizes error with respect to the data. And so in order to address this, you can make synthetic data and then um, therefore you, you, know, you know the answers beforehand and then you can go test your assumptions um, on like already labeled data. Um, currently there are great, fantastic resources for processing data, but um, not a lot for generating data. I mean, you can use the ones that process data to make data, but that's not always like, you know, very easy to do. Um, so I thought that uh, maybe, to, I thought that maybe I could play around with the idea of um, building a library for synthetic data, not for simulations, for synthetic data. Um, and that's a very important distinction. And here's the distinction. So in an agent-based model uh, system, what you usually do is you have, you know, real life objects and they have relationships to each other and the methods of those objects are, you know, involved in interacting with each other and stuff. So um, here, like, you have bacteria, you have petri dishes and you can, like, you know, add bacteria to petri dishes, the petri dishes keeping track of the bacteria and so on. Um, <clears throat> in synthetic data, um, what I have are the objects representing the representations of the models, so that or of the objects. So um, I have classes for um, pictures, basically, and then you know for smaller pictures, and then the smaller pictures can interact with the bigger pictures. Um, and the reason why this is important is because if you um, put it this way, you actually make it more general. So you can have this. Um, so like the. Uh, you know, you, you have like the large image box and then within it you can add smaller image items. Um, you can apply this to many subfields, basically any field that uses images and then those images, you know, interact with each other in some way, um, you can use it. So like the image item can be a cell, a protein, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so to use an example, I cut out example one, uh, cell migration. So cell migration is uh, a combination of forward motion to fill in uh, empty space. It's Brownian motion because it's just kind of wiggling around. And it's cyclical motion because the cell is kind of like going forward and then pausing and then going forward. Um, so uh, I, this is like, I guess, the demo portion. So um, I made a scratch and I also defined a behavior function. Um, the important thing to note about the behavior function is that it's designed so that the closer you are to the edge, which is the black region, um, the more f your behavior is dominated by forward motion rather than Brownian motion. And the reason why I said it like this is because then when you lay these things out, so all these like blue dots are actually their own object with a, you know, time, uh, you know, behavior, behavior hooks taking in behavior functions um, and location index, et cetera. Um, each of these is getting attached a slightly different function. And actually you could use like a different function altogether if you wanted to. Um, 
And so as you can see, I tried to make the API pretty simple. Like uh, the segment channel function is actually just, you know, some scikit image stuff. Um, everything becomes a file image object. Uh, it gets added to like a, a synth image object. And then, um, you know, you attach some hooks to it. And then you can, once you run the stack, the time series, it just uh, executes the functions that you've already attached to it. So um, you may have noticed I call you know, the small blue things actors, I call the large thing a stage, and that's because it's, it's a lot like a play in that you have um, you, your actors, you have like the script that they're all, they know that they're supposed to do, and then you have the stage, which is where they all do the stuff on. And this can be actually applied to many different fields. Please see my poster where we can talk about, you know, um, other modules, not just imaging. This is just the one that I happen to have up right now for show. Um, so if you're even remotely interested, please come talk to me about it. Um, thanks for all the funding to those people. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you, Pamela. I was really hoping that was gonna involve some 80s music, but. Um, uh, all right, so up now, up now we have uh, Nick Murphy, and then after Nick is Scott Collis. Scott. So to, to give Nick a little bit of a chance to, to set up, because the thing fell, um, Anthony, I have a question for you. Paul. What if I'm a SciPy attendee, hypothetically speaking, uh -huh. and um, I've got go a on. black screen that I want to show some people? Okay. How do I do that? I think you just have to come up to the podium. It's really pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was trying to get at, how does one sign up for a lightning talk? Oh, that is a great question. Uh, uh, one signs up for a lightning talk by going downstairs to the board and s writing your name and a potential talk title on our lightning talk sign-up sheet. So uh, anytime today or tomorrow, please feel free to do that. So, all right. Thanks. I was trying to get this set up in a flash so it wouldn't spark any more lightning puns. Oh. <laughs> Student. So. <laughs> um, oh, you clap for him? You clap for yes, him. Thank you. Okay. That, okay, I see where this is going. It counts against his okay. time. It's fine. <laughs> okay. So it's appropriate that I'm giving a lightning talk because I'll be talking about plasma physics and. Uh, lightning creates plasmas, so it's a nice example of a naturally occurring terrestrial plasma, so there's a nice connection there. Um, so, uh, the topic is plasma pi. So, open science in the plasma physics community is lagging behind other fields, and this is in, is in terms of both access to data and uh, software. So, several of us have recently started working on PlasmaPy, um, which we're hoping will become a fully open source Python package, Python ecosystem for plasma physics. And we want this to have the core functionality that is needed for um, all sorts of different subfields of plasma physics, like plasma astrophysics, uh, solar and space physics, which is where I come from, uh, mostly the sun, uh, fusion science, so things like tokamaks and um, uh, stellarators and things like that, and also other basic laboratory plasma experiments. So we want to uh, follow the lead of AstroPy and SunPy. They're well-established packages. They're awesome. Uh, I really like uh, having the chance to use them. Uh, and they, following them gives us a head start on this work also. So uh, if any of you happen to work on plasma physics, I'd be happy to talk with you more about um, how we can work together on creating a package like this. And uh, if you want more information, you can do a web search for PlasmaPy GitHub or PlasmaPy Zenodo to get some references. So, all right, thank you. Thanks for being done in a flash. Um, Never go up against a plasma physicist when puns are on the line. <laughs> <laughs> um, right now we have Scott. And then after Scott, uh, Bill Spots. Bill, oh, there we are. Thanks. All right. I used to be a plasma physicist once. The experience was shocking. <laughs> um, so as you'll know, I've got 4% on 
left on my battery. So I, I, like, I like to live dangerously. So um, I'm the lead for the Python Arm Radar Toolkit. It basically exposes the world of radar meteorology to the SciPy stack. Um, we are blessed because we the Arm is not the Arm chipset. Now Jonathan works on Arm chipsets. He used to work for Arm, so it actually stands for Atmospheric Radiation Measurement. Uh, it's a uh, program of DOE, and we're very lucky to have funding from them. But with great funding comes great responsibility and reporting, and so. We're in the middle of doing a roadmap um, to lay out a five-year vision for where we want to be and making sure that we're um, responsive to the stakeholder community. If you are interested, Google PyArt Roadmap. It's going to it's a it's a open open process. It's an open um, anonymous process for people who want to contribute comments. So that's been a very interesting experience. Um, uh, <laughs> Especially for people who give you some comments and you kind of say, you, can't, you know this is open. You really don't want to be saying those things there. Um, so again, if you Google PyArt Roadmap, you will get to that. Um, I'm also interested if anyone's doing something like this, how they're doing it. So I have a poster over there for this afternoon. I'm very curious to see how people have dealt with laying out these kind of things before and um, getting feedback. We actually ran a survey and we got some very interesting data out of that. I'm going to try and do a live click there. No, that's going to take too long. So anyway, stop by my poster. Okay, finally, an ad at the very end. Um, so I'm the chair of the symposium on advances in modeling and analysis using Python at the um, American Meteorological Society conference here in Austin, and here in Austin in January. So um, abstracts for that close on um, August the 1st, to those of you who are in the atmospheric sciences, and you know, maybe some of you out there in the atmospheric sciences and use Python, um, please get your abstract in. Thank you. It's still running. Risking battery life and limb. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> Arm, get it? I, yeah, yeah. Uh, did, we, you, we got did you it. catch that one? Yeah, we, we got it. It was good, ish. Um, <laughs> all right. All right. Now we have Bill, and then after Bill, we have uh, Zhao. Are you? All right. There we go. Thanks. Uh, okay. So uh, I'm currently working with atmospheric uh, physicists, and they. Um, they build uh, parameterizations for global climate models. And uh, I was trying to convince them to, hold on, no. We're having a lot of luck here. Um, I was trying to convince them to use uh, Jupyter notebooks to document their, their, uh, their verification tests. And I don't know if I'm able to show you anything. USB-C? No. It's, it's just... Try this one? Yeah, try that one. Oh, there we go. Anyway, uh, these are not Python people, but I opened up a Jupyter notebook, and let me see if I can get rid of that. Wow, okay, this is. Anyway, so I opened up a Jupyter, Jupyter workbook and started showing them all the cool stuff you could do. And of course, it impressed them. But the one thing they wanted that uh, I couldn't figure out how to do was uh, citations. They want to be able to cite stuff uh, regarding the tests, where they come from, how they do them, and so forth. And so uh, I had to go out and, and kind of figure out how to do this on my own. So what I, what I wanted to do starting with something like this, a Jupyter notebook, and it's hard to see, but in there there's markdown, square brackets, and an at, and a bibtech citation key. 
Any, anyone not understand what I'm talking about when I say BibTech or LaTeX? OK, everybody, that's awesome. So, so I have this, and I have uh, a BibTech uh, you know, reference file, a BibTech database, and that, would, that describes you know, all the uh, citations there. And those, with those two things, I wanted to create uh, you know, a static web page that had the same text a references section that was automatically created by BibTech, and all of those markdowns changed to, you know, real citations. And again, yeah, it's hard to see, but this is a different format using parentheses instead of numbers. It uses author and year, and the references are alphabetized rather than in numeric order. And you can do all of that with uh, citation style language files. So that was the idea, um, and my Google search really showed up. A lot of tools, a lot of powerful tools, but nothing that did exactly what I wanted. Um, <clears throat> under Jupyter, there's the NB Convert tool. This is very powerful, but it does not handle citations. There's Pandoc. This is also very powerful. In fact, it's used under the covers by NB Convert. It supports multiple input and output formats, not just Jupyter notebooks and HTML. Um, <clears throat> but again, it doesn't do citations all by itself, but there is a Pandoc filter called Pandex Citeproc, Citeproc, which does, okay? Um, but this does not take Jupyter Notebooks as input, but otherwise it does everything just the way I want. Um, so I needed to combine these tools in my own script to do um, what I want, and fortunately, nbconvert and pypandoc are Python modules that I can use. So the procedure, really quickly, is read in a Jupyter Notebook, uh, extract the citations, by searching every markdown cell, generate a new body of text with only the citations in it, and then use that filter to convert, do all the conversions, pull out those conversions and put them back into the notebook, and then create the HTML. So, um, <clears throat> this isn't available anywhere, but if there are any Jupyter Notebook developers out there who are interested, um, I'd love to talk to you. Cool. Thank you, Bill. Well, I'm converted. I don't know about, huh. yeah. yeah, that was bad. Um, uh, I'd just like to oh, point I, out that uh, the bad puns at this point have received less applause than, as far as you're concerned, I'm a carbon-based life form like yourselves. And, uh, and at this point, the projector, the faulty projector, has gotten more applause when it starts working. <laughs> so let's just leave that as a footnote. Or bring it front and center. <laughs> Um, I mean, you like. Now we have um, uh, Scott Cole. So, Scott, are you around? There we go. All right. Everybody clap. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about the IPython unit test. It's a uh, uh, tool that I made to add test support to Jupyter and IPython through cell magic. Zoom, zoom. Oh. Zoom, zoom, like master. <laughs> okay. So, uh, to install it, just pip install IPython unit test. But before I start, I, I'd like to invite you to answer a survey about computational computational experiment at scipy.npmetal.net. And I invite you to visit my poster about a different project at, behind the screen at the last row. So I already executed the loadx here to load the extension. And this command with the dot dojo Add this toolbar here with a timer and other tools for coding Dojo. I implement this tool for originally for coding Dojo. So coding Dojo follow a, use baby steps for with tests for development. So let's say we want to create an add function for from scratch. So we start with a failing code here with a search. Oh. <laughs> Go T. 
So here we have a failing test. So we, we implement the most simple code and then we create another test. And now it's failing and we can do this one plus y. And then the third test. It's failing, we can, let's say we change to this. It's still failing, and since we are using a search, um, it stops at the first test, and we don't know if any other tests are failing or not, because a search raises exceptions. Um, we could use the unit test that comes with Python, but the code is big, and it requires creating a test loader and it's quite verbose for what we want. So in this case, we know that there is one test failing and that's the first test. So how can we do that with the simple assert syntax? And that comes this uh, extension that we can add a cell magic that runs, and now it says that's failing, and also the timer here got red because the test failing. So if we fix the function, it can, becomes green. Um, we can split the tests using strings. So here we want the first two, and you, you want here the last one. And now we have only two tests with the asserts. Uh, we can show the code that this assert generates using the dash u, and we can also add an option dash p1 to after executing the cell, it goes back to the previous cell directly, so you can just execute and go back and change it, execute and go back. And there are other magics to write code with syntax highlights, so here for JavaScript, and execute external tools. Here it calls Mocha and others. So I invite you again to visit my poster, that's about another thing and to answer this so uh, and you get a dsl and you get a dsl and you get a dsl all right let's hear uh let's hear it for show and then up next we have scott cole and then after scott the last talk of the day last lightning talk hey, right hey anthony hey so so um do, do i do i do i get a dsl yes Paul, you get a DSL. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone gets a DSL. Um, the last talk of the day is Daniel Smith. Is Daniel? All right, perfect. So, hi everyone. Who also gets a DSL, Paul? That's that's fine. I'm okay with that. I, I wanted to talk to you guys about what I like to do in Python that hasn't gotten as much attention as uh, visualization toolboxes at this conference. Uh, so there, there are some urgent problems that a lot of us in the burrito community are aware of. Uh, the first of which is that uh, sometimes when we go to these taco shops, we order a burrito and aren't subsequently satisfied with that burrito. And that leads to millions of dollars wasted each year, uh, only in San Diego and even more all across the world. Uh, services like Yelp haven't been sufficient to uh, solve this problem. And also, we all admire these burritos, but we don't completely understand them. What, what makes a great burrito great? What are its core qualities? So uh, our <laughs> graduate program in San Diego has proposed a solution to this problem where we have defined some key dimensions of the burritos and uh, go around to different taco shops and analyze what we see. And you can see them here. So one by one. <laughs> Very, uh, burritos are known to be filling, so size is a really important dimension. Uh, they should be hot. And third, the tortilla quality should be, uh, 
should be high, well cooked. Uh, th this tape measure is pretty special because it's been wrapped around over 100 burritos across, <laughs> across the country. Uh, then, as for the actual ingredients, we separate the quality of the meat from the rest of the fillings because meat has its own unique flavor profile. And we also look at the ratio between uh, how much meat there is versus the rest of the fillings. But not only the ratio, uh, we look at how these ingredients are distributed throughout the burrito uh, and noting how the salsa, the flavor of the salsa interacts with the flavors of the individual ingredients to combine, to make a taste greater than the sum of its parts. And finally, we look at the wrap integrity. We, re we measure these, these dimensions on a scale from one to five for each burrito that we consume. So we've been around San Diego to around 70 taco shops. Uh, our progress is plotted here with a darker blue indicating a higher overall satisfaction rating uh, at, that, at that taco shop. And then we have a, a little spreadsheet with, that has around 300 burrito ratings in it, which uh, you can load up in Python really easily, uh, just in this top cell here, if you go to bit.ly slash burrito data uh, into re your pandas read CSV, you can pull up that, that data frame. And uh, then you can start playing around and looking at uh, the statistics in that data frame, such as, is it worth spending $10 on a burrito? Are you really going to get uh, much better quality in that? And at least in our data set, we don't see any relationship <laughs> between how much we pay for a burrito and the overall satisfaction rating that we derive. Uh, another critical question is how each of those 10 dimensions that I mentioned to you all earlier contribute to the overall satisfaction rating, which ones are most important, and are each of them actually uh, critical. And we do see, uh, so we did a linear model to see how each of those, uh, how highly each of those dimensions are weighted, so a higher bar here is a heavier weight for that dimension. So surprisingly, the meat quality was only the second most important feature, and the wrap integrity was, was one of the least important features. So that was very informative for our research. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and another, uh, some other interesting analysis comes in an unsupervised manner with principal components analysis, uh, which the, the first component was trivial, it was just a better burrito versus worse burrito. But the second, uh, the second component picked up on this interesting phenomena that when we have a bigger burrito, when the volume is higher, that's a trade-off with uh, worse wrap integrity, uh, worse ingredient uniformity, meat to filling ratio, and also the temperature suffers. Uh, this isn't something that we had to explicitly test in the data. This just fell out of uh, principal component analysis, where you can see that Lupe's Taco Shop is one of those that uh, specifically suffers from this, whereas the taco stand is where you should all go uh, if you ever go to San Diego, because they have the best burritos. So there is a link if you want to help contribute to this data set, bit.ly slash burrito rev. Uh, and if you want to go analyze the data for yourself, it's at my repo srcol slash burritos. Um, and let me know if you want to rate any burritos in Austin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that talk. I thought it wrapped up a lot of the core issues facing the professional burrito community, and it got to the meat of the important issues. Right. As long as we get the takeaway points. Oh, was that a tasteless pun, you might say? <laughs> I'd agree. There... All right, that's all that we have time for today. Uh, I think we'll end on the burrito note, so which may or may not have sufficient flavor for you. Thank you and see you again tomorrow. Yep.